You think your house is a nightmare? These are the real scary homes that starred in some of Hollywood's most spine-tingling flicks. From Halloween to The Ring, we'll go behind the scenes and behind the screens. Most every teenager that comes in here is like screaming when they see the loft. And perhaps even scarier, we'll get the inside scoop on what it's like when Hollywood comes calling. I came in the house the first day they had taken possession, and I was just absolutely shocked that all of my walls were pumpkin orange, and I thought, what have I done? Real homes, real scary. Next. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Real Homes, Real Scary. I'm your host, John Burke. One of the most important elements to a good scary movie, aside from the special effects and those moments that make you jump out of your seat, it's got to have a really great house. Now, first up, one of the most famous opening scenes in scary movie history, one that definitely makes you want to scream. In 1996, Wes Craven's Scream became an instant classic. Its opening scene featured this place, the Scream House. This real scary home, located in California's wine country, is a windowed sanctuary with great views from nearly every room. Not that that worked out so well for star Drew Barrymore in the end. The script talks about this girl who is in a fishbowl, essentially, um, and she thinks she's safe, and we think she's safe, but as we all know, when you're in a fishbowl, they can see you when you can't see them. And what the producers saw in the Scream House was the perfect balance of normal and frightening. In this particular house, the uh, movement between rooms was good. The size of the rooms to shoot in was very easy for a film crew. The scary interplay between outside and inside, all of that was here for us to use and take advantage of. The Scream House is owned by Kate and Barry Smith. And lucky for the movie, their teenage daughter Molly was home the day the location scouts came calling. I imagine they saw the chimney from the road because you can't see the house at all and just call down and I happened to be the one that answered the phone and said sure come on down okay, great it was a lot of fun I had a lot of fun watching it and taping it Molly made her own behind the scenes home video of the production one of my most favorite scenes of the movie was filmed right here on this very stove. This is, of course, the infamous Jiffy Pop scene where Drew has innocently come to prepare her evening snack for her night of horror movies. Then again, if Drew knew what was coming, she probably would have gone out to the movies instead. The production made good use, however, of the home's design. Not to mention its oddly perfect stove. We kept coming back to the stove. We could see it expanding and getting more tense, and just like the scene was getting more tense. And the stove has this grill that's even more jagged and more knife-like and scary. And that just came with the house. One thing any real scary home needs is an open floor plan. That way, you can chase your protagonist all over the place with ease. The house offered a lot of architectural pathways that Drew Barrymore could run from the kitchen to the television, to the door, to the phone, in and out of dark and light spaces behind columns. It also offered a pool. But rather than a site for a refreshing dip, it too became a signature presence and made a big splash in screen. When they started filming Scream, it was April here in Sonoma County, which means it was very cold and very wet, which actually worked to the crew's advantage because they had heated the pool to 90 degrees in order to create that nice steamy effect that you see in the movie. Scream's opening scene was all about turning the domestic into the terrifying. Lucky for Drew, she had her jock boyfriend to protect her. Didn't she? At this point, of course, Drew is inside the house, and she is looking out at her big football player boyfriend, who is now bound and gagged to this chair. Of course, a beautiful home like this offers many cozy nooks and crannies for a peaceful break from the madness of the outside world. 
The piano, of course, was not here. This was a television. And Drew actually spent a large portion of the time in the movie crouched between this bookcase and the television set, begging for the life of her boyfriend, who was so helplessly bound in the chair outside. So the boyfriend didn't really get to experience much of the house. One of the features he probably missed, these French doors. They add light and style to the home's exterior. And they also provide a handy entry point for deranged madmen who prefer not to ring the doorbell. This is the French door through which a very large chair was thrown to gain access to the house and to Drew. Don't worry, homeowners. The crew switched out the real doors with fake ones. But when it came to the beloved 400-year-old oak tree where Drew met her filmic fate, a little movie magic was required. My mom was very concerned that there would be no damage done to the tree, so the crew actually constructed a brace to hold up the branch. The swing was also a movie prop that they brought in. It was not here originally. Actually, there may still be some blood left on here. Aside from a little fake blood on the swing, the production managed to keep things in the house pretty well intact. We decided to keep it as a memento. It's one of the few props that we have left at the house. Um, and occasionally, we can be seen out here swinging and enjoying the view of the vineyard. It's scary because it's true. Or is it? We'll get the real story behind the Amityville Horror House. And later, Nightmare on Elm Street meets Halloween in the same neighborhood. When Real Homes, Real Scary continues. Now, we've just seen a case where bad things happen to a good home, but what happens when the house itself is bad? Well, then you're in trouble. Especially if you live in Amityville. The 1979 classic, The Amityville Horror, was all the more terrifying because it was supposedly based on a true story. And that story goes like this. A family moves into a house possessed by the restless spirits of former tenants. And let's just say things don't really go swimmingly from there. The exterior of the original location has become a horror movie icon all its own. So, when producers set out to remake the Amityville Horror in 2005, and that original house was no longer available, well, it was time to go house hunting. This house was an entity. This was the antagonist of the film. So the house had to have the right personality to convey that sense of how scary it was. After searching far and wide, location manager Patrick Brady Breen stumbled upon this 120-year-old Victorian in Salem, Wisconsin. There was just one problem. Owners George and Nancy Wolford didn't exactly see their beloved farmhouse as the embodiment of evil. My grandparents acquired this house back in the early 1900s. This was never considered uh, a haunted house or anything spooky. Well, we were very resistant to have a movie done at the house, and we weren't sure what it would entail. So it took a lot of convincing. Ultimately, Hollywood won out, and the Wolfords agreed to the use of their house. But that was just the beginning. See. The Wolfords place didn't actually have the creepy eye-like windows that were a signature feature of the original home. But, this being Hollywood, not a problem. The crew simply built a cosmetic extension onto the Wolfords home. So our challenge here was to build our three-story icon with the eyes and have it actually lend to the original architecture of the house. Originally there was a fireplace that was going to come straight down and end on the balcony, but we opted not to go with a fireplace, and we put vines up a little trellis to try and create a nose with the eyes. Tyler and a crew of 20 worked for weeks constructing the face, or icon, as it became known. We're up inside the very top of the icon itself at this point. This is the original house that I'm standing there. Here are the eyes that look out down into the driveway that we created that actually came up to the very grand front of the house with the icon and the scary windows. 
Once the addition was in place, attention focused on the home's interior. In the movie, the Lutz family loves what they see when they first move into their new home. Art director Marco Rubeo knows the feeling. This brings us to the interior of this magnificent house, which, as you can see by the detail in the woodwork, we had a house that had everything we were looking for. And that's important, because in the movies, if you don't see it, you need to build it. And if you need to build it, you need to pay for it. The stairway was probably the most valuable part of this house. In the script, even from the beginning, it mentions going up and down stairs and going all the way to the third floor, and there was no way for our budget that we could have recreated this kind of detail without spending tons and tons of money. One of the most chilling scenes in the film is when the mother attempts to rescue her daughter, who had followed a spirit into the attic and onto the roof. Didn't see the movie? Well, don't worry. Crew head Tyler Osman's only too happy to demonstrate. See? Even the crew guys love to get in front of the camera. She's in a panic, climbs out the window, shimmies across the gutter, and grabs on to the ladder. And watching them filming it, that was very exciting. I think there were a lot of different exciting parts of the movie. A lot of times you'd hear the screaming in the house, and of course we were outside, so we didn't get to know what was going on. There was a lot more to this than we imagined. <laughs> Today, the Wolfert's house is back to being a genteel, historical home. But there's one significant architectural feature that remains from the filming, the iconic face. The Wolfords chose not to remove it, just in case there was a sequel, which makes this 1880 Victorian a destination for die-hard horror fans. The icon has drawn a lot of visitors. It was great fun to be part of the movie. And we did enjoy the movie. We saw it several times. You are quite entertained. The type of entertainment that leaves a lasting, haunting memory. But so far, the Wolfords haven't seen any evil spirits hanging around their house. Coming up, Michael Myers and Freddy Krueger. And you thought your neighborhood was bad. And later, you thought the hayloft was scary in the ring? Wait till you get a look at what Naomi Watts did to the front lawn. When Real Homes, Real Scary continues. Is there anything scarier than the suburbs? Probably not. But long before spooky soccer moms and desperate housewives, there was a neighborhood whose homes were so scary, two classic horror movies were filmed there. In a small enclave in Southern California is a neighborhood of well-groomed, anywhere USA houses, each with their own charm. Beware. Many of these homes have skeletons in their closets. This is the home where an escaped psychopathic killer named Michael Myers slashed his way into cinema history in John Carpenter's 1978 classic, Halloween. And across the street is where a young Jamie Lee Curtis had to fight the killer off to escape from peril. There goes the neighborhood. And talk about typecasting. When the producers of Nightmare on Elm Street were looking for locations eight years later, they decided it didn't get much scarier than here. So with Nightmare on Elm Street and Halloween filmed here, this neighborhood's definitely got a claim to real scary fame. <laughs> I think my home is a star. Uh, it's uh, just uh, you know a house that looks like it might be anywhere USA. Part of what these movies are is to make a counterpoint. In other words, you're in a horror film and then you look at a house and it just looks innocent. It's just so friendly and happy sitting there. We desperately wanted it to not be Los Angeles or any particular place, but somewhere that could be easily identified by the audience as maybe even their town. Sure, who wouldn't want to live here? That is, unless you have a problem with Michael Myers and Freddy Krueger hanging out on your block. The producers of both movies like this location for another reason, however. 
uh, an economic one because uh, the cost of building sets that were so elaborate, stairways and staircases and all that, would have been prohibitive for us. The Halloween House's cozy suburban vibe stands in stark contrast to the evil doings of a horror classic. Well, this is the living room where the babysitter was babysitting and there was a television going. Annie the babysitter didn't even make it past the first reel. And when two of her friends stopped by for a visit and couldn't find her, well, they checked out the rest of the house. This staircase leads to the upstairs and to the bedrooms. The girl had a little rendezvous with her boyfriend upstairs. Of course, nothing ruins the fun like a sheet-draped ghostly apparition appearing in the doorway. She thought it was her boyfriend in disguise, and wow, that's pretty creepy. Needless to say, things don't go very well for this group of friends after that. By the time Jamie Lee Curtis pops over, she finds her friends gone, not to mention the furniture all rearranged. The bed was actually... Uh, uh, between where that armoire is now so they didn't bring any any props uh, you know they, they just uh, they just used uh, what was here using what was here was also why so many houses in the neighborhood got co-starring roles in the movie nightmare on elm street director wes craven used houses that were across the street from each other it made sense for budgetary reasons but cinematographer jacques haken believes it added to elm street's scary appeal we shot in here because we were doing shots, putting our actress here and shot over her shoulder to the house across the street. You could actually see out this window to the other window there. You really felt that you were on the street. Nightmare on Elm Street was such a suburban hit, it spawned seven sequels. And as if that weren't enough, Halloween also had seven equally horrific sequels all shot right here. So if you plan to take a trip to Los Angeles around Halloween, forget star maps and the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Instead, you just might want to tour the average neighborhood to catch a glimpse of these classic American horror film real homes. That is, if you're not afraid. Coming up, sure, you'd invite Hannibal Lecter over for dinner, right? He would be inside the house doing terrible scenes and he'd walk out and he would shift right back into being Tony Hopkins. And later, he sees dead people. We see a turn of the century Philadelphia row house when Real Homes, Real Scary returns. Our next Real Home was featured in Hannibal. 2001 sequel to the classic Silence of the Lambs, and it featured a dinner scene with a decidedly interesting menu. So let's check out the house where it all went down. This is the West Bocock House, a charming, well-mannered 1871 Victorian in Richmond, Virginia. This is Hannibal Lecter, a charming, well-mannered psychopath with an appreciation for the finer things in life. Clearly, this is a match made in movie heaven. Now, you might think that anyone would be happy to lend their house to a movie production, but you'd be wrong. Well, it's a daunting task, knocking on doors, scouting, for someone to allow a film crew to come in of 150 people to, you know, to go all through your home. But every so often, you find that perfect house. It had the character of an older style country home as well as spatially large enough to accommodate a film crew. The rooms were laid out in a certain way that was a lot of character movement and things, elements had to be in place. The kitchen had to be close to the, the dining room and things like that, so it worked out. The West Bocock House is owned by Billy Reese West, and after allowing Hannibal into her home, her mantra became, it's just a movie. I realized when I did this, there's a thing of reality <laughs> and a thing of fantasy. So I kept my mind on it was make-believe. One of the advantages of having movies in your house is having movie stars in your house. And Hannibal star Anthony Hopkins made himself right at home. He would be inside the house 
doing terrible scenes, and he'd walk out and he would shift right back into being Tony Hopkins. One of the movie's most infamous scenes is the dinner scene, where Ray Liotta, playing FBI agent Krenler, finds himself on the menu. But before Hannibal the Cannibal could hit the kitchen, the crew had to whip one up from scratch. So this is the, the actual dining room of the house, which we chose to make into the kitchen because of the size and the, and the proximity to what we made the dining room. Basically, the dining room table was here where the sofa is, and they had a little kind of cooking set up here for, for Hannibal. It was a very interesting transition because you would have never realized it had been a dining room. The refrigerator was over here in between these doors, and then we built a long island across in here and had a hanging pot rack. Over here, they brought in a fine stove, a twenty or $40,000 stove, and I was hoping they'd leave it, but they didn't. But the movie makers did leave some parts of the house as is. Billy's bedroom served as the spot where FBI agent Starling nested for a brief nap, while Hannibal cooked up a feast downstairs with Krenlum. And I do mean with. Hannibal's special recipe required some serious cinematic effects. This is the back porch area, which is directly behind the, the living room or our dining room, which is right through these doors. And this was the area where they set up the motion control camera for all of the effects. For Billy, it was scary enough welcoming 150 cast and crew members into her beloved home. And from what she could see of the filming, she figured she could wait for the DVD. I wasn't in the middle of that, so I, I stayed clear <laughs> of the bad things. I saw some on the monitor, and I saw enough to know that I didn't really need to see the movie. After the filming, Billy was a bit hesitant about using some of her dishes. They used a chafing dish, uh, and it was one of the props. And I don't know what good food or bad food they had in it, but when I got it back, it had nothing in it. Still, it's not everyone who got a charming autograph from Hannibal Lecter and lived to tell about it. Bon appetit. Next time you check out Hannibal, pay very close attention to the dinner scene. When Hannibal and Clarice Starling are in the kitchen, there's a vegetarian cookbook visible in the shot. It's just some of the humor that always finds its way into even the scariest of movies. Coming up, the place where they shot the ring becomes an unlikely tourist destination. Most every teenager that comes in here is like screaming when they see the loft. And later, I Know What You Did Last Summer. You probably rented I Know What You Did Last Summer and checked out Jennifer Love Hewitt's Hideaway Home. When Real Homes, Real Scary continues. When the producers of 2002's The Ring were location scouting in tiny Monroe, Washington, they knew that they had hit the bullseye. That's because they found a home with perfectly quaint country style and just the right hint of gothic creepiness. This is the Emerald Glen Horse Farm, idyllic, pastoral, heavenly. Of course, in the real scary world, looks can be deceiving. Most every teenager that comes in here is like screaming when they see the loft. In the film, the character played by Naomi Watts tracks down the origins of a mysterious videotape to this hay barn loft where a little girl named Samara has been keeping a secret. But the barn almost didn't pass the audition. Originally, they were going to use the house. They weren't sure they were going to shoot anything in the barn. But after uh, thinking about it, they decided that it would be a great place to have the loft. There was just one problem. There was no hay loft. But, hey, this was Hollywood. They built one. 
Farm manager and resident of the main house, Rusty McKean, kept a close eye on the production. And they put in the scaffolding right here, and they cantilevered it over uh, for a shot into the, the loft inside our barn. And also, when they, they built the loft inside, they didn't plan correctly for the windows. And so they've actually moved each of the windows out about a foot from where they originally were on there in order to make room for the loft inside our barn. In the finished film, the Emerald Glen Farm hayloft takes center stage at the movie's end. And like most actors, it isn't quite ready to leave its starring role behind. Evidence of its screen, heyday, is still present. First thing you saw when they came in was a giant breaker, and the actor threw the switch, and then the lights came on, and you came right into the horse barn here and saw the ladder that went right up to the loft, the little room there where Samara was. And the antique paint is still there, the aged wallpaper, the little architectural detail from the house, it's all still there. The farm was also the site of numerous other scenes from the movie. And this being the Pacific Northwest, well, let's just say producers had a difficult time persuading Mother Nature to learn her lines. And this is the driveway that Naomi Watts walked down. And over on that side, where the highway is, they had the lighthouse and the camera for the shots. And this, during the movie, was all wet, it was all muddy. It was a very rainy winter when they were shooting. Naomi walked along as she uh, walked up to the porch to look for Mr. Morgan when she first got there and did this shot, I don't know, maybe a hundred times that night. In fact, Naomi Watts did so many takes of the scene that she wore a path into the grass. And how's this for spooky? Four years later, the path is still there. Coincidence? Maybe. The exterior of the house got some screen time as well. You know that horror movie standby where someone appears in a window in an apparently abandoned house? Yep, they did that one too. Well, the top left window up here is, is the room that they did use and had a shot with the, the actor out of this room. So far, Susan Connor hasn't seen any creepy peepers on the second floor since filming ended. So far. Knock on wood. <laughs> what she did see, however, was the way in which Hollywood productions tend to take over once homeowners have thrown their hat into the ring. This whole project got just a little bit out of hand, and pretty soon they had spread out over the whole farm. Filming around a working horse farm, though, would be a challenge, especially since in the film, all the horses were gone. So it gave it that kind of spooky effect that here's a horse barn. It's huge. It's still here, but there's no horses. Something horrible's happened. So a creative decision was made. Just to be safe, Susan's horses had to be moved off the property to temporary housing. Then the crew, with tools in hand, decided that the barn was a little too dark, even for their dark, scary movie. The solution? Simple. Raise the roof. We actually took out a huge section of our roof. I believe it was around 30 feet of our roof in order to get the light that they wanted inside here. Sometimes, producers leave more than just fat checks in their wake after renting a location. So for Rusty and Susan, it was time for a sequel, a construction sequel. Got our roof put back on. They only used about a third of the screws that were originally in it. So we did have a lot of problems with it and leakage along our ridge cap. And uh, they had to come back so our roof was uh, back to as good a condition as it was before they were here. And three years after filming, it was time for the real sequel. And Emerald Glen welcomed the production back with an open barn. The screen time has spawned a new problem, however. Tourists. Well, after the ring was released, we noticed a lot of teenagers coming onto the property at all hours of the night. It became a problem with security and stuff. So we posted a bunch of um, no trespassing signs. But if fans do make it onto the property, they better not expect a ring expert. For her part, Susan hasn't even seen the movie. Everybody that saw it said it was the spookiest movie they had ever seen. And, you know, I live on this beautiful, peaceful farm in this great valley. It's so calm and lovely and serene, I think. I didn't want to have in my mind all the horror from the film, the darkness and everything, um, when this is a place of so much light. 
Despite its spooky past as a real scary home, Emerald Glen Farm is actually a very famous working horse farm and training facility. Coming up, this seaside bungalow becomes home to Jennifer Love Hewitt and that psycho fisherman in I Know What You Did Last Summer. Jennifer Love Hewitt and her mother had a, a long conversation at the dining room table, which was sitting right here. And then, Tom Cruise is on the run in Minority Report. And if this was your house, you'd run there too. When Real Homes, Real Scary continues. You know, it's interesting. I Know What You Did Last Summer was one of the new generation teenage horror flicks that really kept the genre on the map. And when you know it, there just happens to be a house story here. A hit and run accident turned Jennifer Love Hewitt and her friends' lives into a never ending nightmare in the smash hit slasher update, I Know What You Did Last Summer. As much as Hewitt tries to forget the accident, not even her quaint seaside home can shield her from the guilt or the hook wielding psychopath desperate for revenge. Southport, North Carolina was where location manager Louis DeFelice found the perfect bungalow to harbor Miss Hewitt. This house really had a lot of the things that we were looking for. It had the proximity to the yacht basin. It had the look of a home of a middle class person or a girl who's living with her mom, kind of, you know, scraping by a little bit, but still had a lot of character. This real home is owned by Sally Gilbert. And Sally soon realized that the only thing scarier than a psychopathic fisherman is having your home taken over by a Hollywood production. The location manager called me on April 1, said, Sally, the people would be there to move you out of the house at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. And that was not to happen until a few days later. And I said, I hope this is an April Fool's joke, Lewis. He had gotten his date screwed up. So I was out of here the next morning. He won that battle. You've heard of buyer's remorse? Sally had location remorse. For 32 days, her home was taken over, not to mention repainted in orange. I came in the house the first day they had taken possession, and I was just absolutely shocked that all of my walls were pumpkin orange. And I thought, what have I done? This is absolutely atrocious. What have I done? Um, it's actually the most elaborate paint job of any location that I've ever had control of. Of course, with the benefit of hindsight, now she loves it. The paint job that you see in this room is movie paint. I have never changed it. Of course, I think that the paint job is a work of art. Sally was an unusually determined homeowner. When the production wanted to change aspects of her home, and believe me, they did. She stood firm and used that one word that nobody likes to hear in Hollywood, no. Jennifer Love Hewitt and her mother had a, a long conversation at the dining room table, which was sitting right here. And they had called me at one point during the filming to ask me if I would allow them to move my lighting fixture to center over their dining room table. And of course I said no. I said it's absolutely impossible to move a lighting fixture on a tin ceiling. So uh, that was vetoed. Next sequence is that mother comes in this door with the letter, the famous letter. Hands it to Jennifer Love Hewitt and she opens it and it says, I know what you did last summer. And there's a funny story pertaining to this door and that the movie crew called me inside the house and says, will it be all right with you if we cut off this door so that we can get our cables under it? And I said, absolutely not. You may not do that. These are the steps that Jennifer Love Hewitt ran up after having received the letter. Jennifer looks out the front window, which is this window right behind me, and hears the rustling of the bushes outside. She's quite spooked, and I won't tell you any more at this point. In the end, it's questionable whether Jennifer Love Hewitt's character survived her nemesis. But Sally did, and she considers her match with Lewis and the film crew a dead-even draw. 
In fact, when it comes to being part of a successful horror film, she's hooked. It was definitely a pleasure to be part of a successful film. I enjoyed the experience very much, and I would certainly do it again. <laughs> Nineteen ninety nine's The Sixth Sense was one of the most buzzed about and most successful movies of the year. Set entirely in Philadelphia, location scouts knew their territory and they knew what they were looking for. Director M. Night Shyamalan wanted a turn of the century row house to be the home of Cole and his mom, played by Haley Joel Osment and Tony Collette. And he found what he was looking for in historic Philadelphia. There was just one problem. It was too small. But hey, that's what neighbors are for, right? Well, right now we're standing in front of the building that served as Cole's apartment. The house on the right ends where this white gutter is. And the house on the left, over here, actually has its front door around the side. This configuration of these two houses worked really well for us because it can read as one apartment building. In order to make the homes one, Doug painted their exteriors a uniform color and also redid the window mullions on both places so they'd match. We brought in a period door with one large piece of glass in it and painted in gold leaf garden apartments on it with an address. This is the door that Haley Joel Osment first comes out in the sixth sense. Although the exteriors featured prominently in the finished film, the interiors were shot on a soundstage for greater control. So, when homeowner Clarina Tolson watches the movie, she doesn't see dead people. She sees someone else's living room. So the inside of my door was draped in black. So when they opened the door, you went into a black hole of sorts. And you then went into a living room that was not my house. Clarina's next door neighbor was luckier still. She got the full experience of having a film crew in her house. Right now we're in my spare bedroom, which is at the back of the house. It overlooks the guard court. And what they did is actually dress this window to match the soundstage window. And they actually brought the camera up and did a perspective shot where the mom is watching her son go off to school. Outside both homes is a common garden area, and this too afforded filmmakers everything they were looking for, or through. We've seen Bruce Willis sitting across here on this bench right behind me. He sees Haley come out, writes a note, and Haley zooms off. So Bruce doesn't know where he's gone. He starts following him. They go along. We get this cat and mouse shot through the trees and through the bushes. It was weird, you, you know, know, what it meant having them do that cat and mouse game with the flora and fauna here made it a little creepy. Yeah, it was creepy. It was Which scary. You don't think of normally <laughs> that our garden is creepy, but that's the way they were able to use it. It's the power of movies. In fact, the only significant alteration the film crew made on the block was adding 20 park benches. But they did have to remove some things. Like street poles, like this one behind me. It was right in the middle of our shot. So we contacted the city, they came in, the power companies removed the wires, they pulled the pole for us. The pole was put back, but the benches stayed and made a nice addition to the neighborhood. And we've maintained them. Uh, our garden club paints them annually and we really enjoy them. This historic block in Philadelphia is now filled with memories of the production. And it's even made Clarina and Mary Ann real film buffs. Haley Joel Osment was incredible. I mean, it really was an amazing performance. And you know, since then, I do watch his career because I feel connection to him because he lived in, he lived house, in our house. Right? That's right. Clarina and Mary Ann are stars now in their own right. Neighborhood stars. That's right. We've gone down the history in this block, and we're very proud of the movie, very proud of how the block was represented. The neighbors were just tickled pink. One of the cool things about M. Night Shyamalan, who directed The Sixth Sense, is that his first three movies were all shot entirely in Philadelphia, his hometown. Tom Cruise and Steven Spielberg want to shoot in your house. You say no, then 
they bring out the heavy artillery. Next on Real Homes, Real Scary. We end with a movie that has all the special effects and bells and whistles Hollywood can afford. But in 2002's Tom Cruise mega blockbuster Minority Report, finding just the right house was as much a part of director Steven Spielberg's vision as anything else. The year is 2054. Psychic beings that see the future have convicted you of a crime you have yet to commit. Sound crazy? Well, Minority Report may be a futuristic sci-fi flick, but director Steven Spielberg wanted to resolve the film's high-tech action-packed climax at a quintessential beach house, a home that would symbolize peace, serenity, and escape. And he found it on an island in Virginia's Chesapeake Bay. But since it was so serene, the homeowner wasn't that interested in disturbing the peace. When my father first got the phone call from the film people, he was not very happy about the idea of having folks come down here. That all changed when the grandchildren took up the filmmaker's plight. They got very excited about it, and over the weekend, I took my kids to speak to him about Tom Cruise and Spielberg. By Sunday, by, uh, by the end of the weekend, he was good with it, and the rest is history. They were down here. All 250 of them with their gear, which included several massive cranes. Assistant location manager Oriana Robertson was there from day one. There were location people, painters, medics, construction people here for at least a month before the actual filming crew showed up. Outside, cranes were moved into position to rehearse for the movie's most spectacular and dangerous stunt. Three crime agents would drop 70 feet from the sky onto the roof to apprehend Tom Cruise. We had a large crane boomed over the house suspending a box truss system where the stuntmen were attached to by rope so they could rappel down onto the roof. But inside was a different story altogether. As set designers wandered from room to room, they were pleasantly surprised to find the interiors matched almost exactly what Spielberg was looking for. That meant it was time to bring on the actors. Spielberg and Cruz and company were here for three days of shooting. Colin Farrell the first day, Cruz the second and third day. And then actually a fourth day of shooting where they did a special effect with the uh, crane on top of the house and the people dropping down on it. For all the hustle and bustle, most of the scenes filmed in the Mock's home were actually fairly sedate. This is a room where they filmed uh, Tom Cruise's wife coming out to uh, see Tom Cruise drive up in his car. They filmed out of the window, and you can see this room looks pretty much the same that it did in the movie. They did very little change to the room. Well, this is the bedroom where the scene was filmed with Tom Cruise and his wife. Uh, they came over to this bed here and sat down and they were looking over at the precog who was over at the window over here. This is also the room where Tom Cruise was arrested during the movie. Troopers came in from the side of the door there and came in, put the halo around his head. Very climactic scene, very tense scene during the movie. And having a Hollywood production in your peaceful beachfront home is definitely an arresting experience. But just like that, the movie makers and stars were gone. And things returned to normal in the Mock's beloved home. And when the cameras stop rolling and the popcorn's all gone, these real homes remain a real cool reminder of a little bit of Hollywood history right here in the neighborhood. Thanks for watching.